story of how you got here. Uh, yeah, that was part of my planning, uh, my intro. Yeah, I have already planned that, but it, it's like really brief uh, story. Do you guys see my screen? We do. Yes. Your your share okay. is up. We've got um, we've got four minutes until we we get into the presentation. So we're just gonna okay. chat with you for a little bit until we get started. Okay. Um, awesome. So shall I unshare my screen? Uh, you're you're welcome to keep it up while, while we're talking. Okay. I'm I'm really excited about this because. Um, purple teaming, of course, is, I, I don't think it's a new concept, really. I think it's something it's that it's not, and, but it's, it's new to, I think that it's really the way it's been formalized as a, as a process. Um, we published a purple team exercise framework, and that's looking more at the traditional red and blue together. And what I thought was really cool about when I, when I'd reached out to Tripti, and again, she's going to talk about how she showed up here but I'd seen that she'd given this talk before and I had never seen anybody put purple teaming in application security. Yep, 2016, last con. That's where I first gave the talk because I was awesome. tired of being one person AppSec show and just red teaming or just blue teaming was not working out. I had to combine both and create a feedback loop between blue teaming and red teaming. So yeah, today you will get to hear the story of how this all started. So are we live right now, Brayson? We are live, yeah. No, we are yep. we are just oh, okay. here chatting. Every, the, we're keeping the audience entertained until we start the formal presentation. Okay. So Brayson, how did you got into purple teaming? How did I get into purple teaming? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so... Um, I used to do really uh, spooky things a long time ago, and mm -hmm. I um, started Grimm uh, by myself as a consultancy back in 2013. And nice. at the time I had this idea for um, a more integrated operations loop for being able to, um, uh, you know, essentially conduct offensive operations and then a feedback loop for understanding that because that's even today, that's still relatively simplistic. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as as the years went on, we started getting into commercial penetration testing and commercial mm -hmm. red teaming. And it was really interesting for me coming from, you know, where, I mean, again, red teaming is meant to be the emulation of an adversary's tactics. Mm -hmm. And there's a number <clears throat> of compromises that are inherent in that approach because uh, you can't spend the same amount of money as, uh, you know, a client's not going to spend that amount of money in that amount of time. And red teams generally can't spend that amount of money or time to, to do something that is like, you know, the equivalent of like, we're actually like the Chinese APT. Um, and so I knew those compromises, but I didn't realize how far down those compromises went. And so it was several years of, of learning that. And one of the things I quickly picked up was um, and I think anybody who's done offensive security, whether that's penetration testing or red teaming, um, where you do the test for the client, you come back a year later and it's the same thing. Yep. It's yep. the same vulnerabilities. And you think about it and it's like, well, I mean, I gave you this 50 page detailed report. Why didn't you fix <laughs> these things? And the reality, of course, is, well, you know, they've got their normal lives of doing these things and that's not always a priority. And so I just kept thinking there had to be a better way. Um, and one, I felt like the process could be improved. Why, why can't we help them fix this as we go? Um, mm -hmm. Two, I didn't like what I saw, the ego-driven mindset of penetration testing and red teaming. And that's a talk I've given, um, I don't know, I think I first gave that talk in 17 or 18, um, mm -hmm. because I got the impression that the teams were just trying to win. They weren't mm -hmm. trying to help the client. It was, how can I how can I win? How do I get to AD? How do I drop mic? And boom, I won it. You know, like, and the, the, it's not business oriented and it's not beneficial um, and it's it's adversarial. So that's where I naturally found myself into the concept of purple teaming before I even knew what purple teaming was. I'd never heard I the see. phrase. I just had arrived at it intuitively from my experiences. Okay, you know what I thought? That's super simple. I knew you have some sort of military army or Navy background. I thought you were actually a Navy SEAL in your past life. And that's where you learn not only defense, but a bunch of attack techniques, and you brought those to cybersecurity. So were you a Navy SEAL? 
I was uh, an army officer. Okay. I'll, I'll try not to take that as an insult that you thought I was in the Navy. No. <laughs> Everything is very uh, respectful to me. Thank you for your service. I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I'm just teasing. Uh, yeah, so I was, I was an army officer. Um, I worked in the intelligence community and national security for a long mm. time. Um, and then uh, for those of you who aren't aware of my current biography, I still uh, participate in government. I was a strategic advisor to the director of CISA last year. Uh, that's Chris Krebs. Um, I left in November. And I'm also um, an advisor to the board of the Army Cyber Institute. Okay, cool. But this isn't about me, Tripti. <laughs> this is about you and your awesome presentation, which we look forward to hearing all about. And I cannot tell you again, when I, when I saw that this was in your background, I just really liked when you and I, I'm not going to give away again how we met and why you're here, but I just, I really liked it when I met you. And when I saw that you had done this, this I wanted to see how this works. So I'm... Can't wait. All right. So let me put you. Let me. Do you guys see the presenter more? Yes. Yeah. No? Yep. That's good. Yep. Awesome. So, uh, Grimcon, thank you so much for inviting me here. What a pleasure to be here. And the short story is um, how I found out about Grimcon is I happened to uh, meet the founder of Grim. Brayson Bort uh, in a panel talk uh, for security innovation. And uh, the topic of the panel talk was purple teaming. And I'm like, wow, I don't even know there is a whole company out there that exists that believes in purple teaming and helps their customer with purple team approaches. So I was very impressed. And uh, Brayson actually asked me, hey, do you want to talk at GrimCon? I'm like, why not? I will be more than happy to share uh, 15 years of my product security learning and how I adopted Purple Teaming here. With that, let's begin. So uh, before we get into Purple Teaming, a little bit about me. It's been 15 years I'm doing product security and uh, I was a mobile game developer who did not know the difference between a random number, secure random number, and a cryptographically secure random number. So as a naive developer, I have done a lot of mistakes that I would not do now. And this really helped me to understand the pain points of development teams, engineering teams in general. And I realized uh, how fascinating product security is, and I decided to uh, switch my career from mobile development into product security. After 15 years of product security journey, I have recently started my entrepreneurship journey. I will be working on uh, building a genomic privacy startup pretty soon. Uh, but before that, uh, I have led application security programs at Amazon, Q2A Banking, Illumio, who is a uh, leader in micro segmentation, and HP. And when I'm not doing security, I like to travel, paint, and meditate. If you have any questions about purple teaming or content that I will be presenting here, or if you want to have just a, you know, informational chat with me, feel free to reach out uh, at these social uh, media handles. So today uh, I will be obviously talking about uh, my experience as part of blue teams, my experience as part of red team, why these two teams are not sufficient, then what uh, purple teaming philosophy is. And then I will talk uh, how we can implement uh, purple teaming as part of the software development life cycle to scale and make it more impactful. Uh, I have a couple of examples, and then uh, I will be providing a reference to a case study done by Security Innovation and Illumio together. With that, uh, let's begin. Um, as you all know, purple, uh, sorry, blue team uh, members are those security engineers. They work with uh, engineering team, development uh, teams, QA engineer, and they basically uh, educate uh, software developers about security controls, defense, way early in software development life cycles. 
whereas a red team members can be an independent internal security team which focuses on hacking shit out of a product or it can be an external penetration or testing team that uh, uh, security teams usually engage right before the product moves to production or right after uh, basically when the development is complete the motto of security team uh, the blue blue team is basically they are optimist they believe in the power of security controls they believe in empowering developers about the knowledge about security controls and they try to work with these engineering team to make sure the product that they are building all the security controls are considered and i uh, look at blue team members as bunch of optimist whereas secure uh, red teaming members these are more paranoid people they never think that security controls are enough and these people are so creative no matter how much effort blue team folks have put into securing the product the red team members always end up finding vulnerabilities and that's because they focus more on exploitation technique and creative ways of exploiting the product do you all agree with me now with that what's purple teaming right uh, as you know i love painting one day while walking in an electronic store fries i was thinking why is it no matter how much effort i put helping my developers about security controls defense the red team members in my case mostly external penetration testing teams they always find some new attacks every time there is a new tech stack uh, or a new framework used by engineering then the red teaming findings are even more and while walking in that shop i was thinking why is it why can't i help my development teams so that the findings in a penetration test report literally becomes zero what is it that missing and then it struck me you know what as a blue team member i'm teaching my developers everything the security controls the requirement techniques i'm doing threat modeling but i never discuss exploitation techniques with them the exact exploitation techniques used by red team members and that's when i thought i need to create a feedback loop between per, uh, between blue team and red team and when we mix blue and red together it becomes purple teaming and purple teaming folks are realist let me uh, give you guys another analogy so blue team folks when they help uh, their engineers with throughout the product development with bunch of security controls and what not they roll out the most appropriate security tools to help them speed up the secure deployment and delivery of the product these are optimists let's say they are stuck in a storm while sailing in ocean the blue team guys believe that you know all the controls defenses their product has they are going to easily survive and pass through that storm whereas my red teaming member the paranoids one they are like you know what this ocean in that scary storm is so bad we are not going to survive whereas what purple teaming members do is they do not get scared they are not super optimistic they are the realist one what they do is they prepare for the worst they hope the storm will pass soon and in order to survive in that storm they make necessary adjustment by uh, adjusting the direction of the sail that's how they survive now let's talk how this purple teaming philosophy can be implemented in the form of process i'm sure you all have seen security within software development life cycle the top half of this um, diagram shows waterfall sdlc usually nowadays uh, 10 15 years back waterfall sdlc was very common but now the industry has moved into more agile software development life cycle 
as we are going more and more into a more microservice oriented architecture. Uh, but in some of the legacy applications and system, we still see waterfall as TLC exist. So if you look at uh, how security is weaved in in today's uh, software development lifecycle, we will see that uh, at requirement phase, we uh, security members do threat modeling. Then in design phase, we do something called design architecture review from security perspective. In coding uh, deployment phase, uh, security engineer roll out those fabulous static code analysis tool that help developers find code related issue. Then in testing, we basically implement and roll out bunch of security testing tool. It could be a dynamic application security scanner or open source security scanner, or it could be interactive application security scanner. There are like bunch of tools out there. Today's talk is really not about uh, tooling so I, I don't want to shift my focus and then when the product the application is ready to move into production or has just moved into production basically the code base is mature we hire penetration testers to come hack our application and find as many security issues as possible now as you all know penetration testing is expensive plus it happens way late in software development lifecycle. When we do threat modeling, uh, we basically use checklist approach or same for design architecture review. So the result of penetration test, we cannot replicate way early in software uh, lifecycle development. If you look at the second, uh, the bottom half of the image, uh, which shows agile STLC, more or less we do the same techniques but the frequency of these security assessment methods are actually different uh, the speed of delivery and deployment is so high in agile sdlc that we put more emphasis on uh, basically tools uh, and again the story is same when the product is mature and uh, it is available in production that's when uh, we conduct external penetration tests. Uh, let's take a, another look at uh, the same software uh, lifecycle development, but through CI CD. So, with the rise in microservices, uh, we, the industry has adopted more continuous integration and continuous delivery model. And here we give paramount emphasis on rolling out the right tools. And for some reason, uh, the industry thinks that if you have the tools, that means you have the security. You have done all the necessary due diligence. But in spite of all these tools, penetration testers still find really good security issues, right? Yes. So why is that? And I believe that most of these security tools are still in their first generation. They don't necessarily have the context of the business logic of the application or they are not exclusively made based on the technical stack uh, the particular application uses that's why there is like a lot of false positive and uh, it's a nightmare to deal with uh, not nicely tuned security tools so i'm, I'm not going to uh, get there but basically in spite of having army of security tooling still there is something big is missing now, when I talk about purple teaming, which is basically mixing the knowledge of exploitation techniques and security controls and making your developers educated about it, this is how it looks like to me. So in requirement phase, uh, the way, or even before requirement phase, uh, imagine when you approach uh, developers or QA engineers or you know any engineering team with bunch of security findings from penetration test report, they don't like it. It's their baby. You're calling their baby ugly with all these security findings. Generally speaking, they do not like it. But when we approach development uh, teams with security trainings, then they feel empowered. I have worked with so many smart developers and nobody has ever not liked security training. They really appreciate when security teams approach them with very comprehensive security trainings exclusively designed for their stack, their style of uh, architecture pattern, 
uh, used by the engineering team. So when I try to do purple teaming, I always, always start with developer security training. If they are using Ruby, React, JavaScript, I don't try to teach them vulnerabilities in C, C++. I focus on their tech stack. So purple teaming always starts with developer security. In requirement phase, irrespective of what uh, SDLC you're using, uh, I try to teach them security requirements and I have a detailed um, uh, example just uh, after a couple of slides. In design phase, I not only tell them security controls, but I also explain them exploitation techniques. And what I request them is now you fine tune your design based on the exploitation technique. And then the rest of the SDLC goes uh, in the similar fashion. So let's take a quick example. This is an unrestricted file upload feature. Uh, this type of feature is very common in a um, lot of applications. Uh, it could be you know, uploading image or simple text file. So uh, let's see how I apply purple teaming uh, to this particular feature. Before I apply a purple teaming, let me explain you as a blue team member, what would I do? As a red team member, what would I do? So as a blue team member, whenever I see uh, my developers are building this type of feature or they have recently built this type of feature, I make sure uh, to educate them about, hey, you know, bad guys can access this feature and they can upload nasty stuff like virus. So make sure you only allow authorized user. Then I also try to tell them about uh, file size. Make sure you put a restriction on file size. Uh, otherwise, somebody can upload a zip bomb, right? Uh, then I talk to them about, hey, make sure you do all sort of input validation by checking the right file extension. And please do not use a blacklist approach or sorry, deny list approach. Always list allow list approach. The extensions that you are expecting please ensure that those are in the allow list instead of blocking all the bad extension and once the file gets uploaded to the server don't forget to run antivirus now this list looks pretty comprehensive right yes it is pretty comprehensive and it can probably take care of 90 percent of the attack now as a red team member I think like an attacker because at any cost, I want to take down this application. I want to upload shell script to take over not just the application, but eventually the system and network. That's my intention, right? So I try to think about all sort of creative ways. First thing I try to look, hey, can I bypass uh, any function level access control? Level? Then every file has a magic number associated uh, with it. The magic number is actually the signature of the file. So by manipulating the signature of the file, you can basically upload uh, bad malicious files into the application. Then not only this, I try to see that, can I change the content of the file by adding injections? I actually tried this uh, in a banking application which accepts uh, Excel spreadsheet, I try to add cross-site scripting and SQL injection as a content in that file. The application was doing a decent job at uh, verifying the extension size, uh, authorization uh, of the user, but it was not doing a good job verifying the content. And I was successful uh, creating a cross-site scripting injection there. Now, let me wear the hat of a purple team member. I have the knowledge of red teaming techniques. I have the knowledge of security control specified by blue teaming. I'm going to mix these two together. So I'm going to turn my exploitation techniques into security requirements. So let's go back here. I have already, let's say hypothetically, I have already trained my developers about what could go wrong with file upload. Now I am explicitly mentioning the exploitation techniques and turning them into security requirement even before they write a single line of code. And in this way, 
I am shifting that security towards left. I am making my developers purple team members because they are no longer just developers. They are no longer just security focused people, but they actually have knowledge of exploitation techniques. That's what purple teaming is. And when, when we have those type of discussion at requirement phase, the uh, probability and uh, the probability of avoiding these type of security findings is so um, high. Also, by preventing these issues from occurring, we are eventually reducing the cost associated with fixing these issues as well. There was a beautiful study done by NIST in 2002 and it talks about cost of fixing quality bugs in each phase. And compared to production, uh, issues identified in production, if somebody fixes these issues in requirement design phase, it is 10,000 times lesser. Same thing applies for security defects because security defects are nothing but quality defects. Security is actually part of quality. So why deprive our developers from this knowledge? As a security team member, why should I keep all this knowledge of exploitation technique just to myself? When I share it with developer, it becomes easy for them to implement and it becomes easy for me to scale it at higher level. So let's take a look at uh, another uh, example. Now, uh, the first column here indicates security principles. These are the 11 security principles and if you if you can think about any 12th please get in touch with me i'll be more than happy to uh, do another talk with you the next column uh, shows security requirements the third column shows security control and fourth column shows exploitation technique now imagine a developer has not written a single line of code they have come to you to uh, give to get security requirements on session IDs. Basically, they are building authentication module. Now, uh, one of the simplest security requirement when somebody deals with uh, authentication is the session ID should be sufficiently long. They should be random and unique across all correct active session base. Right. So this is the requirement uh, we have given to the development team. And then uh, in order to further secure the session IDs, we also tell them a security control that, hey, you can even do a digest of that uh, session ID and make sure you use a cryptographically secure random number and you use a FIPS approved uh, crypto library to compute the digest. Now, as part of purple teaming, do not stop here. You have done a good job as a blue team member, but as part of purple teaming, remember we are supposed to teach them about attacks that could happen. Now, as a red team member, when I see a bunch of session IDs or random numbers, what do I do? I do entropy analysis and I try to find out if the entropy is less. I try to do a brute force attack, right? So let's educate our developers about these exploitation techniques in requirement phase itself and help them partner with them to find the right library that can defeat entropy analysis as well as brute force attack. So that's really purple teaming is. Now, um, let me cover some other aspects of purple teaming. As I explained before, uh, it is extremely important to approach engineering team through training. And you can create purple teaming through your uh, security trainings. Second, not, do not just focus on developers, QA engineers, the people who actually write code, test code, but also focus on architects, focus uh, on your product managers, focus on uh, your program management office who are responsible for all the releases and schedule and also execute uh, also on the executive team because it's the top down approach that always works bottom up approach doesn't work so in purple teaming focus on all sort of roles and responsibilities 
that are important uh, to ship a product and then weave security accordingly. As I explained in those two uh, examples, always map your business requirement to security requirements and then eventually explain the security requirements in the form of controls and exploitation techniques. You will be most successful implementing purple teaming approach when you speak the same language of your software development lifecycle. Do not keep the security knowledge to yourself. Go attend their scrum meetings, go participate in their bug triage meetings, go participate in each and every story time and explain the controls and exploitation techniques. So when we completely immerse ourselves into engineering processes and life cycle, that's when uh, they understand us and that's the real success of purple teaming. And eventually uh, create a win-win situation for all sort of parties. Uh, you can do this by acknowledging their efforts. You can do this by calculating metrics that, hey, once we applied a purple teaming approach, see how many less bugs have been found by uh, red teaming members. Or ever since we implement purple teaming approach, see QA engineers are fully capable of finding security defects or you know, the over, how the overall posture of uh, security posture of the product has improved. So call out those wins, uh, reward uh, their efforts. And what I like to do is every six months, I like to uh, um, host a hacking event where I invite all my developers, QA engineer, VPs, director, and come participate, hack with us. All right, uh, so that was about purple teaming. Uh, let me conclude here. My time is almost up. So we just now saw having red teams uh, doesn't help. Uh, red teams and blue teams, they both are extremely important for security of the product as well as organization, but they working in silos doesn't help. When there is a feedback loop, uh, between red teams and blue teams. And when we share that knowledge with engineering teams, that's what purple teaming is. And purple teaming kind of approach a mo offers a more holistic approach. Purple teaming can be easily weaved into uh, organizations, software uh, lifecycle development uh, process. And as I explained, when we educate our developers about exploitation techniques, the number of issues that get produced are less the number of uh, defects security defects that get identified the remediation rate uh, is very high because developers already know how to fix it find it and fix it the overall roi becomes super high and i genuinely believe in my 15 years of experience it's the purple teaming that truly facilitates uh, shift left and it also helps to scale uh, application security. Uh, recently, I had done a, a case study on purple teaming with security innovation. And if you guys are curious or keen about uh, how I had implemented uh, purple teaming in the past, I would highly encourage to check out this case study. Uh, with that, uh, are there any question answers? Uh, so, yeah, we already have a question. Uh, will the slides be available to download? Is there some place that folks can get these? Uh, yes, the slides are already available in my LinkedIn profile. I have shared them on uh, SiteShare. Also, I'll be sharing the slide deck with a GrimCon committee. Um, the case study that you mentioned there, is it possible that we could paste that link somewhere? Uh, sure. Do you guys still see my screen? No. Oh, uh, do you want me to share the link uh, right now? Yeah, if we could just po uh, po uh, paste it in chat. Absolutely. Just that, that link for the, the case study, and then we'll also throw it on Discord. Absolutely. So when did you first come up with this idea? Uh, 2015. Uh, when I was one person application security team at Q2E Banking in Austin, Texas. Nice. So similar, nice. right? There's got to be a better way. 
yeah all right um let me share this in chat Uh, Grace and I think you guys still see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is the case study and I'm kind of struggling to open the chat. Um, okay. Uh, I think I'm not allowed. Okay. If you, if you email it to me, I'll, 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 I'll okay. post it. I can do that. probably want to stop sharing your screen so we don't see your email oh, there you okay. go finally. <laughs> I, finally. I just I, i'm always so oh. sensitive about that opsec fail whenever i share my screen oh my i'm like okay. oh no people are going to see something sensitive <laughs> i know i know and here is a link to um the case study uh, unfortunately this talk is an hour long and because i had only 30 minutes i had compressed it so there are many more aspects of purple teaming that I, I would love to uh, explain if anybody's interested, like how to implement purple teaming in a typical software lifecycle development. What are um, some common mistakes you've seen in that implementation? Uh, some of the common mistakes, I'll start with people. Um, you know, just because security engineers are excited about security and they're passionate about security, they assume everybody's interested in security. And unfortunately, that's not the case. So what you will see is out of 100, uh, 100 engineering team members, maybe 50, 60 are interested and not everybody. So we have to keep that in mind that besides security, people have other things uh, on mind, such as you know, uh, releasing the product on time, uh, making sure um, the shiny new features that generate revenue gets preference over security bugs. Um, so that's one thing I have seen. Not everybody's excited about security, but those who are excited about security, giving them ad hoc ad hoc knowledge and training and making them your ally, kind of creating security champions, that really helps. The second mistake I've seen is not getting executive buy-in um, from the top tier management upfront. It's extremely hard to weave security in the software lifecycle development and you need right budget, right resources. So when you don't talk about these things upfront, uh, it becomes di difficult and security becomes afterthought. The third mistake I've seen is rolling out incompatible security tools. As I said, security tools are still in their first generation. They still produce a lot of false positives. There are still uh, true, neg true, uh, true uh, negatives. So these tools, when, when you are doing proof of concept uh, to select right tool for your organization, always make sure you include your developers, QA engineers, get their perspective as well how they are going to feel about operating on these tools. It's extremely important. So, and another thing I want to call out is there is just way too much um, emphasis on buying commercial tools. Sometimes it is uh, super easy and cost effective to build your homegrown security tools. Uh, would you like to hear an example, Brayson? Absolutely. 100%. So, <laughs> I have seen um, a lot, and this is a beautiful example of purple teaming uh, approach as well. Uh, in one of the organization I had worked, I had seen a lot of sensitive information was getting leaked into logs. Now, application security folks do not take a look at logs. Logs are something analyzed by uh, the infrastructure security team members in production, right? They have access to SIM and they sometimes may catch it or may not catch it. But getting sensitive information leaked into logs is such a crucial problem because these logs, let's say in case of a SaaS application, these logs get shipped to customers and from customers environment, God knows which business analytics uh, will uh, capture and you know may encounter sensitive information. So this is a really big problem. 
And in spite of teaching my developer, I, you know, do not um, do not log sensitive information. I was not having great success because, to be very honest, development teams they do generate uh, logs for debugging purpose. That's how they debug. And when they are testing security features, it is quite possible that they may log session IDs or credentials or whatnot. So just having a proactive approach of telling them, hey, do not um, capture log was not sufficient. So what I did using my purple te uh, teaming hat, I requested, I participated in their story time and I exclusively called out a security requirement. Once this feature is complete, QA engineers will write uh, automation to look for session IDs, credentials, uh, tokens, and all sort of sensitive information that this feature is using, and they will make sure that it is not getting locked. I did not stop there. I requested a uh, development team to actually write a homegrown scanner. So they wrote a simple grab based filter that can scrub logs and it, it, it basically checks for these files. So in this way, throughout the software lifecycle development, not only the requirement story time, but also in design QA and post production base, we solve this problem. And having our very own homegrown security scanner to identify sensitive information inside logs was so much more effective then learning sim sim tool and trying to uh, find the, this type of information uh, it probably took uh, half a day for development team to write such tool and because it, this tool was written as a collaborative effort between security development and qa guys qa guys immediately plugged that tool into automation qa automation framework now that tool runs on all the releases all the test beds and we get to uh, we, we basically identify sensitive information asap so that was my purple teaming approach to solve this issue so um follow-up question on that since you you started talking about something that came out in our panel which is um like in the security community we take for granted that people even know what red and blue is right mm -hmm. and in the building community right it's like that's not that's just like we throw it over the fence right it's the classic like development to operations challenge um but then there's all of these security components to that which are uh, essentially a part of quality and features right we're turning them into mm -hmm. features and stories and agile development so that they're they're incorporated in that way um mm -hmm. but something i still have i i think it would be interesting to as like a further step in that maturity would be building um system of systems security testing into the the pipeline so not just you know particular features to application but recognizing that an application runs on a system and there are other systems around that and the security is not just directly the potential vulnerabilities on the application on that system but also you know potentially what could be um an unintended consequence somewhere else or on the plus side where i'm mitigating and controlling those um even though i didn't realize it or i or i can implement those controls and know that so because a vulnerability is does not necessarily have to be addressed directly mm -hmm. yeah um i like to talk about uh you know defense in depth uh, approach you know many times uh development teams may not have time to fix the vulnerability by making code changes and that's where, as you explain, Abrason, uh, we need to rely on security controls provided by the system or security and security controls provided by the network at organization wide level. For example, you know, there is a cross site scripting in some application. The application is already in production and it would take, let's say, two person days to fix that vulnerability and then test it and release the code. We don't have that much time. Hey let's go for WAF. WAF is an organization-wide uh, you know, control and it will prevent the injections from getting into the application even before those cross-site scripting payloads reach uh, the vulnerable application, we stop it. So WAF is a great control. Another good example I can think about to prevent is CSP, Content Security Policy. 
which is also implemented for entire uh, application, the enterprise application. And it can prevent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And because of these defense and diff techniques such as CSP or WAP, we are actually giving our development teams enough time to thoroughly fix the vulnerabilities and test the fix. Well, that scratched my itch. This is what I was looking to hear, and I, I really appreciate it. Trisha, do you have anything? No, I. this has been so fun, like listening to both of y'all go back and forth, because it, it's such an interesting concept. And I I had never even thought about it as specific to the AppSec side, which is is huge. It was such a great talk, such a great talk. It makes so much sense, you know? It's like, it seems so obvious, but I've never even thought of it. Yeah, and uh, uh, Trisha, when I tell my developers and QA engineer, I am the blue team or red team, but you guys are my purple teaming now because you are now fully knowledgeable about the exploitation technique relevant to this application. You are my purple teaming. They get so excited and thrilled. I can't even tell you. Love it. Again, it's another theme that we've had with almost everything is, you know, this positive reinforcement and bringing people together. And, you know, it's, yes. it's a very important aspect of our community, 100%. Yes. So it's like extending our security community to development teams and utilizing on their skills. Like it's been 15 years I've written uh, code. So, you know, it was kind of tricky for me to write that log scanner. And when I asked my development team to do it, they are like, yeah, boom, half a day. And here my log scanner is ready. Oh, I so, love yeah. it. I'm going to be picking your brains one-on-one -on -one in the future because I've got some, some implementation ideas in that space. Um, and I have a funny feeling that this stealth startup you're a part of might be connected to the space as well. Sure. I am happy to help in any aspect. I, I do believe in purple teaming. The artist inside me believes in purple teaming, Brayson. So yeah, utilize me wherever you want to. And I'll help well, with whole heart. And with the uh, site gift card to the swag store that if you, you haven't seen it was, was sent uh, a day or two ago, um, you can get a purple unicorn. Uh, so what our purple team t-shirt you know, uh, I have already ordered it, but now I want what you have. You have some golden unicorn, right? That's oh, a golden. Oh, so I should have I should have changed colors. I have <laughs> I have my purple team. So this is this is my summer unicorn outfit because, as Trisha noted, um, I was giving her uh, professional unicorn advice that the onesie gets hot. So I don't wear onesies anyway. Um, I have custom um, hoodies, and so I have. I don't what was it did I wear a hoodie for our panel I did didn't I yeah 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 um, you did I I remember that yeah. wonderful hoodie yeah so uh, so I have the blue team the red team nice and the purple team this is such Very a flex cool. right now Bryson such a flex yeah and then the there golden go. unicorn on top of everything love it but yeah, so I, I also have I should have I should have switched out my my uh, summer unicorn uh, for the purple. Well, wh we have one minute left. Why don't you do it? <laughs> well, I mean, it's going to be you sit there watching me mess around with Velcro, and um, I think it's going to just <laughs> okay. look embarrassing okay. that I'm as uncoordinated with Velcro as possible. I show up, you know, in in proper uniform. Me doing the props, kind of okay. messy. Totally understandable. Yeah. All right. Um, so I guess this is it. Uh, once again, uh, Brayson, thank you so much for introducing this wonderful platform to me. Uh, what a pleasure to talk here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>